Welcome back to our class, Genesis, the Conflict Over Creation. We're glad that you joined us to study how to handle and carefully interpret the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. Our instructor is James Rochford. In this episode, we will evaluate the biblical interpretation offered by young earth creationists. In this episode, we're going to engage the biblical arguments given for a young earth. First, do the genealogies of Genesis date the age of the earth? Bishop James Usher, who lived from A.D. 1581 to 1656, was one of those who added the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11 together, and he dated the earth to 4004 B.C. Many young earth creationists follow in his footsteps, considering these genealogies to date the age of humanity. So how old is the earth? Well, as we've just seen, the Genesis account tells us that God created the earth on day one of the creation week and man on day six. So that means the earth is only five days older than man. We read those ge genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 and in, repeated in Luke 3 verses 23 to 28 and the available evidence points to human history and cultures only being thousands of years long and we'll come back to that later but there are serious flaws with this approach first at most this approach would give us the age of humans not the age of the earth or the universe so even if the days of Genesis are, indeed, consecutive 24-hour days, we must note that these days do not begin until Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. The text does not tell us how much time transpired between the creation of the universe in Genesis 1-1 and the beginning of the creation week in verse 3. Second, the Bible nowhere adds the years of the genealogies together. This is actually an inference of the interpreter, not a teaching of the Bible. The Bible nowhere adds the genealogies. And this is quite interesting because the Bible elsewhere adds up cumulative spans of time. So, for instance, it states that the Hebrews lived in Egypt for 430 years, Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. And Solomon built the temple 480 years after the Exodus, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. But Genesis never adds up the genealogies. Third, the words used in the genealogies have a broad semantic range. Specifically, the verb became the father of. This is the Hebrew term yalad. And the noun, father, which is the Hebrew term, ab or abba. These do not imply a strict successive ancestry of father to son, of father to son, and so forth. Okay, let's start with that first word, became the father of. Yalad means to, quote, bear, beget, or bring forth. However, the word does not necessarily point to the generation which immediately follows. In Hebrew thought, an individual, by the act of giving birth to a child, becomes a parent or ancestor of all who would descend from this child. In fact, the term may show the beginning of an individual's relationship to any descendant. The term father, which in Hebrew is ab, can be translated as father or as forefather. This term designates primarily the begetter, though by extension it could be ancestor, and metaphorically it could refer to the originator, the chief, or associate in some degree. The term can be translated as grandfather. So, for example, Genesis 28 verse 13 or even as a remote ancestor, Genesis 10, verse 21. Fourth, without a doubt, generational gaps exist in the biblical genealogies, and here we'll just consider a few examples. Arpachshad lived 35 years and became the father of Shelah. This is Genesis 11, verse 12. 
In Luke 3.36, Luke points out that Canaan lived between these two people. So he adds a generation. 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. Joram, his son, Ahaziah, his son, Joash, his son, Amaziah, his son, Azariah, or Uzziah, his son. Now what's interesting here is that Matthew skips these three generations in his genealogy. He skips Ahaz, or Ahaziah rather, Joash, and Amaziah, stating instead that Joram was the father of Uzziah, not Ahaziah. So instead of saying that Joram was the great-great-grandfather, he just says that Joram was the father of Uzziah, or Ahaziah. Matthew chapter 1, verse 8. Number 16, 1. Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Koath, the son of Levi. Now, Levi was one of the twelve patriarchs who entered Egypt. Therefore, these three generations extend over four hundred years, which obviously implies that there are numerous intervening generations in between. First Chronicles chapter 26, verse 24. Shabul, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses, was officer over the treasuries. Now, a straightforward reading of this text would state that Moses was the grandfather of Shabuel. The obvious problem with this interpretation is that there is a 400-year gap in between these two people. Matthew records that Jesus is the son of David, who lived a thousand years before him, and he also calls Jesus the son of Abraham, who also lived 2,000 years before him. Now, clearly, Matthew did, did not intend for us to think that Jesus was the literal son of David or the literal son of Abraham. First Chronicles chapter 6, verses 3 through 14, omit Jehoiada, Uriah, Azariah, Eli, and Abiathar. When we compare this with the list given in Ezra chapter 7, we find that Ezra omits some of the names in this chapter, 1 Chronicles 6, and he adds two names. Fifth, the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11 have literary symmetry that might imply generational gaps. So, for example, Noah is the tenth generation from Adam in Genesis 5, and Abraham is the tenth generation from Noah in Genesis 11. So much like the genealogy of Jesus, the author of Genesis used this symmetry to connect the major figures of history, not to give some kind of an exhaustive list of descendants. Sixth and finally, a strict chronological reading leads to absurd conclusions. For instance, Noah lived for 350 years after the time of the flood. Genesis chapter 9, verse 28. If we add up the dates between Shem, who is Noah's son, and Abraham, only 292 years went by. This would mean that Noah lived during the days of Abraham. Furthermore, since Abraham lived around 2000 BC, give or take, this strict chronology would date the flood to roughly 2300 BC. And yet the Egyptian civilization dates at least to 3100 BC as a major civilization. And yet this would mean that the flood had completely wiped out the Egyptians after this point. To summarize this real succinctly, the purpose of biblical genealogy was not to show strict chronology. The purpose was to show ancestry or descent, not to show dating. Does the Hebrew word day, yom, always refer to a 24-hour period of time? The Hebrew word for day, yom, has a wide semantic range. As in the English language, it usually refers to a 24-hour period, roughly 97% of the time.
but it can also refer to a longer or shorter period of time. So, for example, it refers to the 12 hours of sunlight in Genesis 1-5. It refers to 144 hours in Genesis 2-4. It refers to a long period of time that even includes the changing of seasons, Proverbs 25-13, or to include the entire 40-year wandering in the desert, Joshua 24, verse 7. It refers to an indefinite period of time. Isaiah writes, The Lord has a day, yom, of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion, Isaiah 34, verse 8. Elsewhere, the prophets refer to the day or yom of the Lord, which is thought, of course, to be a long period of time. Though this is not the common usage of the word day, yom, in Hebrew, even young earth creationists like Jason Lyle concede that an indefinite period of time is one of the lexical definitions of yom. Does the Hebrew word day, yom, refer to a long age of time in Genesis 1? You see, just because a word can have a certain meaning, this doesn't mean that it does have such a meaning. Well, are there good reasons for thinking that the word day or yom could refer to an indefinite or indeterminate period of time in Genesis 1? Old Earth creationists give several reasons for thinking that it does, in fact, have this meaning. Let me give you a few. According to the Young Earth creationist view, the sun didn't exist until day four. Without the sun as a reference point, we can't measure a 24-hour day. Ancient readers would recognize this just as well as modern readers would. Ancient people didn't have digital clocks or stopwatches. Instead, they measured days according to the perception of the sun. The text even states that the sun functioned to measure days in Genesis 1 verse 14. So, are we to believe that these days, 1 through 3, actually existed before the existence of the sun itself? Genesis furthermore mentions the growth of plant life on these days, which implies a long passage of time. Genesis doesn't state that God created the trees fully formed. What does the text say? It says that the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. Genesis 1.12 Now ancient people knew how long it took for trees to grow and for fruit to form. If the author intended us to see this occurring in a 24-hour period, then he would expect us to envision the trees growing in fast forward. Now are we really to believe that this is what the author's intent was? Adam's expression, at last, implies a large passage of time. On day 6, Adam cultivates the garden, Genesis 2.15. He names every animal in the garden, verse 19. And then finally, he gets tuckered out and falls asleep, verse 21. This all implies a very long period of time, especially when we consider how many animals Adam needed to name and to classify. Now, these descriptions make sense of Genesis 2.23, where, where Adam says, at last, when he sees his wife Eve. This implies that Adam had been waiting for a long amount of time to meet her. The same expression, hapa'am, in Hebrew, occurs after Leah had been waiting to give birth after many years. Genesis 29, verse 34 and when Israel sees Joseph after many years of separation. Genesis 46, verse 30. Are we really to believe that Adam had to wait 12 hours and then said, well, at last, I finally got to see you? Well, a lot of men have had to wait much longer than that. Day 7 is an indefinite period of time, according to the text. Interpreters have noticed that, 
that the seventh day conspicuously lacks the repeated expression, there was evening and there was morning. If this is a 24-hour day, then it's odd that it lacks this language. You see, the author of Hebrews explains the significance of day seven. He cites a variety of Old Testament passages to show that God's Sabbath rest continues to this day. He begins by citing Genesis 2-2, which is our passage, but then he continues to argue that God's Sabbath rest moved on into the days of Moses and Joshua, according to Psalm 95, the days of King David, Psalm 95, verse 7 and 8, and even today in the church age. He concludes in Hebrews 4, 9, So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest. So from this interpretation of Genesis 2, we are currently in the seventh day of creation, God's Sabbath rest. This means that the seventh day of creation is not a literal 24-hour period, but an extremely long epoch of time. If the seventh day can be extraordinarily long, then why can't the other days also be indefinite periods of time? The Hebrew language was also very limited, and no other word could have been used to describe such a large span of time. Some people have said that the biblical Hebrew only consisted of 3,000 words in its vocabulary. And so, to compare that, modern English contains about 1 million words in its vocabulary. So, if, it, if Moses, therefore, was to use a term to describe a long period of time, yom was the best term. Others have suggested that the term olam could have been used, but actually this word refers to perpetuity or remotest time. In fact, it is used to describe the eternal nature of God himself, as in Psalm 90, verse 2. So, it could have been confusing to the original audience if Moses had used a term like Olam instead of the term Yom. Psalm 90 could imply using the term day, Yom, to refer to an indefinite period of time. According to the superscription, Moses is the author of Psalm 90 as well as the author of Genesis. In this psalm, Moses is reflecting on God's eternal nature compared to creation. Therefore, this psalm gives tremendous insight into Genesis chapter 1, because here we have the same author writing on the same topic. In Psalm 90, Moses writes this, verse 2, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. Now here Moses begins by comparing God's eternal nature to the temporal or temporary nature of physical creation. For example, the mountains, the earth, the world, and human beings. He says, You turn man back into dust. Moses' reference to humans returning to dust or to the dust of death, is a reflection back on Genesis 3, verse 19. And so this shows that he has the creation account in mind. Then he writes this, Psalm 90, verse 4, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday, Yom, when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. The Old Testament often uses the term thousand to refer to a hyperbolic or exaggerated number. For example, Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, where God gives his mercy to a thousand generations. Or think of Psalm 50, verse 10, where God says that he owns the thousand hills. This is hyperbole. He owns all the hills. So when he uses the term thousand here, a thousand years are like yesterday in the sight of God, this could be hyperbole as well. He even uses poetic intensification to call this a mere watch in the night or a few night hours, according to the New Living Translation. 
So day age interpreters argue that this gives insight into how God could perceive time. As an eternal being, even a thousand year period seems like a day or even a few hours to God. So, therefore, perhaps the days of Genesis are days from exactly this same perspective. Namely, that God is using the word day to describe an indefinite or indeterminate period of time. Does the language of evening and morning require a 24-hour period of time? Young Earth creationists argue that the natural reading of the formula evening and morning requires 24-hour days. When the word evening and morning are used together without the word yom 38 times, everywhere else outside Genesis chapter 1 throughout the Old Testament, it always only means an ordinary day. And then when the words evening and morning are used together with the word yom, day, 23 times outside Genesis chapter 1 throughout the Old Testament, they, the word yom always means an ordinary day. And admittedly, this argument carries interpretive weight. But caution should be warranted in claiming that this requires a 24-hour day. After all, besides its usage in Genesis chapter 1, this formula of evening and morning only occurs in one other place in the entirety of the Old Testament, in Psalm 55, verse 17. Therefore, Old Earth interpreters find themselves attracted to two common explanations for this language. Option number one is that the evening and morning language could refer to the ending and beginning of a period of time. For example, after reflecting on creation, our same author, Moses, writes this in Psalm chapter 90, verse 5. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they are like grass, which sprouts anew. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and withers away. Here, Moses compares the lives of people to grass that grows and dies. Now, of course, ancient people knew that grass didn't literally sprout, grow to maturity, and die all within a 12-hour period from morning until evening. This is why this language should not be taken literally, but instead this could be a literary device that shows the beginning and the ending of a period of time. Another example comes from King David when he writes in Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, God's anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, which is the term Arab in Hebrew, evening. But a shout of joy comes in the morning. And the term here is the same used in Genesis. Here we see poetic parallelism. The evening is compared to a moment, while the morning is compared to a lifetime. Again, this language is used for the beginning and the ending of a period of time. A second option is that the evening and morning language might simply be analogous to human workdays. Ancient Israelites would know that work ended in the evening and began in the morning. Psalm 104 reflects on creation, and it makes this same parallel. It says in verse 23 that man goes forth to his work, and to his labor until evening. O Lord, how many are your works? Commenting on this, Vern Poitras writes this. He says, by analogy, God's work days in creation have times of initiation and times of completion, with rest before and after. The movement from rest to activity to rest constitutes an analogy between God's work days and man's. In other words, God used the common language of a workday, human workday, as an analogy to describe his work in creation. Yet this wouldn't speak to the amount of time that God spent working, and it would leave open the length of the days for discussion. 
Does the use of a cardinal number in Genesis 1-5 require a 24-hour period? The first use of the term day or yom in Genesis occurs in verse 5. It uses a cardinal number, which literally reads one day. Now this is different from the subsequent days which use ordinal numbers, not cardinal numbers. Ordinal numbers would be the second day, the third day, the fourth day, and so forth. Now does the use of a cardinal number one day require a 24-hour day? Well, here we would have to point out that Isaiah uses this exact same language to refer to a non-literal span of time. In referring to the destruction of Israel, Isaiah writes in chapter 9, verse 14, that the Lord cuts off head and tail from Israel, both palm branch and bulrush, in a single day. The Hebrew here is identical. Echad yom, single day or one day. Yet Isaiah uses these terms here to refer to a long period of time, in this case, judgment. Does the use of ordinal numbers require that the term day, yom, must refer to a 24-hour period? After day one, one day, Genesis uses ordinal numbers for days two through five, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, and the fifth day. Consequently, young earth creationists argue that this numbering must refer to literal days. When the word yom, or day, is used with a number, first day, second day, third day, etc., or ten days, in the plural or singular, it's used 410 times outside of Genesis chapter 1 throughout the Old Testament, and it always, always means an ordinary day. Again, caution is in order. While the sequence does carry weight, we must observe that the ordinal numbers only modify days 2 through 5, not all 7 days. At most, this argument would demonstrate that 4 out of the 7 days were 24-hour periods, but not that all 7 days were 24-hour periods. Moreover, the Old Testament uses ordinal numbers in only one other place to describe a strict succession of 24-hour days. This occurs in the eight-day Feast of Booths that is recorded in Numbers chapter 29. But we can hardly derive a strict grammatical rule based on this one other occurrence. Therefore, day-age proponents argue that this could refer to the order of the days, not necessarily their length. To illustrate this and this grammatical usage, we could point to Hosea in chapter 6, verse 2, where we read, He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day. Here, Hosea uses an ordinal number to describe the third day. Yet this day, or yom, doesn't refer to a 24-hour period. In Hosea 6, the prophet anticipates God's regathering the nation after the exile, which extends, of course, over a long period of time. Douglas Stewart, who is an eminent commentator on the book of Hosea, writes this, The poetic figure should not be taken literalistically, in two or three days all will be well, or to mean soon, even in a relative sense. Its intent is more likely that after a set time, Yahweh would again visit his people in mercy. Thus, he would not, in effect, forget them. Hosea's third day, therefore, is surely a long stretch of time, not 24 hours. He uses the word third to describe the order of the day, not the length of the day. Does Exodus chapter 20 require that the days of Genesis were 24-hour periods? Exodus chapter 20 verse 9 says this, Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, 
and rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. We see the same phenomenon in Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. Here it seems that Moses compares our calendar week with God's creation week. Therefore, young earth creationists argue that this demonstrates that both must refer to 168 hours or a typical work week. To be sure, Moses does give a parallel between our calendar week and God's creation week. But is he communicating that everything is parallel between the two? Upon reflection, this cannot be the case. Many dissimilarities exist between God's creation week and our calendar week. Let me give you some examples. For one, God's creation week happened only once, while ours repeats continually when we go back to work every week. Second, God creates effortlessly as an omnipotent being, whereas humans strive and toil in our work. Third, God chose to rest from his work in Genesis 2, but humans need to rest. Fourth, and most importantly, God's Sabbath refers to an indefinite period of time, according to Hebrews 4, verses 4 through 11, while the Hebrew Sabbath day refers to a 24-hour period of time when we rest. Therefore, the length of the Sabbath, the very subject under discussion, is not analogous to a strict 24-hour calendar day view. So many elements are dissimilar between the creation week and our calendrical week that this should give us pause in thinking that a strict chronological comparison is also intended. We see the same six-to-one pattern elsewhere in Scripture, and it's used to refer to large periods of time. For example, God commanded the Hebrews to work their land for six years and then to let the land lay fallow for one year. We see this in Exodus chapter 23 and Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25 4 states, During the seventh year the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. The year of Jubilee occurred after seven Sabbaths of years, or 49 years according to Leviticus 25, verse 8. Moreover, the Feast of Tabernacles lasted for a week to commemorate the wandering in the wilderness. However, the length of the feast didn't correspond whatsoever to the length of the 40-year wandering. This suggests that God used the unit of seven for various units of time, just like when he appointed 40 years of wandering because of the 40 days of disobedience in Numbers 14, verse 34. And we see the same thing happening in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. It could be that God is simply using an analogy between his work and our work. The analogical day view takes exactly this perspective. They point out that God was refreshed, and the Hebrew term here is napas, on the Sabbath, Exodus 31, verse 17. This literally means to take breath or to refresh oneself. It comes from the root word to breathe. But surely this doesn't mean that God was tired and needs a Sabbath. This, of course, is analogical language. It's anthropological language that shows that God's rest is similar in some respect to our rest. Again, Poitras writes this, he says, The six days may be interpreted as God's work days, the times of his personal activity. They are analogous to man's work days. They are presented in terms of personal activity, interactive time, not in terms of clock time. Likewise, the seventh day is God's rest day, which is analogous to man's rest day, the Sabbath. Did Jesus affirm a young earth? Young earth creationists state that Jesus affirmed the age of the earth when he said in Mark 10:6, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. It ends up undermining the authority of the Lord Jesus. There are at least three passages in the New Testament that make it very clear the Lord Jesus believed in a recent creation. 
Mark 10, 6 says that, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female, not billions of years after the creation, but from the beginning of the creation. Young Earth creationists argue that Jesus placed the creation of the first humans at the beginning of creation, not billions of years after the alleged Big Bang. Well, a careful reader will quickly discover that this proof text doesn't prove their point. On the young earth creationist view, Adam and Eve did not exist at the beginning of creation, day one. They came into existence 144 hours later, on day six. So to salvage this argument, young earth creationists like Jonathan Sarfati state that human existence was, quote, almost indistinguishable from the beginning. A simpler explanation is in order. What is the context of Mark chapter 10? Is Jesus teaching about the creation of the cosmos? Is he teaching about Big Bang cosmology? No. Marriage. He's teaching about marriage. The context is marriage. The parallel passage in Matthew makes this abundantly clear when Jesus states this in Matthew 19 verse 4. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. The grammar here refers to the beginning of the creation of humans, the beginning of them, not the creation of the universe. It is for these reasons that we believe that the Bible does not require us to believe in young earth creationism. If we just went by the text, this is one interpretation, although, as you can see, it's not without its own difficulties. And certainly, this is not the only interpretation that is a defensible reading of the early chapters of Genesis. Genesis.